So uh, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much for your patience. We would like to start the session now. Uh, personally, I would like to crave your indulgence about the lateness. So unlike the NSA, we had a few, uh, personally, I had a few technical hiccup. And as it turns out, I'll be the moderator for this session. So I really crave your indulgence. Uh, I tend on my uh, apology. Uh, today we'll be ha having uh, the second phase of our uh, of our session, we're going to have today the lecture two from the NSA lecture series. Um, today we'll be having a very prominent uh, researcher who has been able to um, uh, who has um, been able to explore several several countries, and also while doing so, he has uh, he has gathered a lot of all. Uh, he has gained a wealth of experience and is going to put us through uh, the subject of the day. So without further ado, because our time is far spent, permit me to run down through, uh, give you a rundown of the um, activities for today. Uh, as it is, we have from 9 to 19, I'll be using Korean time, uh, we have from 9 to 19, uh, the welcome note and the reading of the speaker's bow. And after that, we're gonna have the uh, lecture proper, which is gonna start, uh, which is gonna span uh, a one-hour session. And afterwards, we're gonna have like questions and answers for twenty minutes. So I urge every uh, participant to take note of the questions. You can drop your questions in the chat box, or probably you can just send your questions. Or you can you can send your questions to us uh, after the lecture. Uh, we can we, we're gonna give like a uh, room for some people to ask questions too um by turning on their video and ask a few questions we'll be taking note of all the questions you drop in the chat box i have several people working on the underneath to ensure that we have a seamless uh session in the light of that after the question and answer session we're gonna have like a uh, vote of thanks from some of our nsc executives here and afterwards, we're going to draw the curtains of the uh, to the lecture. So today, permit me to introduce to you Engineer Emmanuel Uluwa Shogo. is a doctor. Uh, Doctor Emmanuel Uluwa Shogo received the Bachelor of Engineering degree in Electrical Engineering from the University of Ilori, Ilori, Kwara State, Nigeria, in two thousand and eight. The he obtained his master's degree in electrical and electronics engineering from the University of Lagos, Nigeria, in Lagos, in 2014. And after that, he embarked on a PhD journey and he, uh, in energy engineering from Kyombok National University, and he graduated in 2023. In 2013, he joined as an assistant lecturer with the department at the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at Kwara State University in Nigeria. Afterwards, he left as a lecturer one in 2019. In 2023, he was briefly a postdoctoral fellow with the Microgrid Research Center at Kyombok National University in Korea. Currently, he is a senior researcher and a lecturer in the Department of Industrial Power Electronics Engineering. Uh, I'm not gonna. I'm not sure if, I'm, if, I, if I can pronounce this well. I'm, but I'm very sure that the speaker will do justice to it. So at Fakoskuli in Austria, I'm, I'm very confident that our speaker will do justice to it. So his current research interests include high power DC DC converters, high frequency magnetic design converters uh, for electrical vehicle and renewable energy applications, control and system theory in power conversion. Uh, so permit me to call uh, on um, engineer Dr. Uh, Shogo Tokemano to commence the lecture program. Uh, it's so good to see your face, sir. Yeah, same here. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much. Oh. Yep. Um, okay. Yeah, can you hear me? A minute, please. Yes, can everybody hear him? 
Sorry, my voice is not that clear because of the lecture I had yesterday, like I told you the day you reached out to me. Uh, after four hours lectures, I almost usually look, my voice is almost gone. So, but well, at least we'll try and see how to figure it out. Thank you so much. Yeah, so uh, actually you pronounce it almost the same or the as really? expected yeah it's Fakoshule and uh, which means uh, university of applied sciences mm -hmm. yeah so it's university of applied sciences and um yeah uh, i'm uh, felt so honored to be in the midst at least to interact with the people that we've shared some kind of moment experience for the past almost four years, at least four years in South Korea, Daegu city is so was so wonderful time and uh, it's a memorable one that one can never, you know, left out of my home. If I have to talk about my life, my career and all that, it's a wonderful place to be and wonderful people around during those days. So without taking much of the time, I think is. Uh, better to proceed so that we can finish on time and uh, so i hope my voice will still be clear to the end of the whole thing yeah permit me to share my screen and um call me oh sorry can you see my screen this slide Yes, right now we can. I hope everybody can hear him. Okay. Yep. So uh, the theme of today's program, which is uh, has to do with career pathways outside uh, Korea and navigating study experience and job search. So when I saw this topic, yeah, I was thinking, oh, what am I going to discuss today and uh, where should I start from? And actually, most of the things we'll be talking is, yeah, things that maybe probably the two options that we have. And um, I'm going to talk maybe based on my own experience during the two options, how I explored and what I came across during the uh, recruitment process and all that. <clears throat> so uh, for the content of my uh, slide i have an uh, introduction which we're going to talk about job and uh, what is job and career the similarity or the difference between them and uh, when we talk about uh, career pathways outside korea so we have just basically we have two options uh, we're talking about the academia and the industry and we'll be looking at the career and job search in the academia area, then we're going to talk about the career and job search in the industry. We're going to look at the career path there in those two fields. And uh, we're going to look at the work permit and job seeking visas that some other countries has for high qualified, um, high qualified personnel, uh, personnel like uh, have a PhD bid on a point entry system that we are familiar with just like in Canada but there are some other European countries that have similar scheme that you can probably come to search for job and things like that. Then we'll look at the summary of uh, the whole thing at the end of the presentation. So when we talk about uh, job or career yeah, this is the question that usually, you know, one have to, uh, we are always being confronted maybe after the graduation and it's really tempting to concentrate. Yeah, when, yeah, when you're in the program, which one to go for, especially after a postgraduate program, because at undergraduate, what most of us just think of, oh, during the undergraduate is that after, the whole four or five years in engineering, oh, I want to take one year to relax. If I make good grades, I won't even look for a job. Job will look for me in those days. But nowadays, it's not like that. And after the graduate program, postgraduate studies as well, we're still being confronted with this kind of problems, like questions. Which one should I go for? Is it job or career? But if you look at job, we talk about job in the form of uh, a series of activities which make 
uh, help someone to make an end meet and uh, it may not be necessarily maybe something that you have interest in maybe just due to pressure you have financial burden you want to meet up with so job comes into that category that just to find ends meet and uh, in most cases we talk about it like your personality or your maybe degree or program may not really uh helpful in this case so uh you are your personality does not material in this case in terms of job and when we talk about jobs as well we say that it may not be in a form of a long-term solution like uh we uh in uh, it's just a short time depending on how you look at it it's just like a short-term solution for you to just meet up with these and the rest but most people maybe during the uh having some years on the same job they might probably take it as a career but job is not the same thing as career so it's just a short form of just meeting up with and so you might be doing something that is totally different from your career goals or your maybe your future plan and things like that so and then in that case when it comes to job as well what we can say is that your emotional buying uh is not really necessary in this case so you just want to like okay well whatever we will do is just based on our contract let me just take my money and go and do whatever i want to do but in a case of career which is uh can be categorized as a professional line of work uh, that one has decided to pursue and uh, frequently in most cases you have a uh, need to have some other additional training or education like our qualifications in order to go into that career either by uh, vocational programs or normal uh, educational settings in a degree form like higher degree then what usually helps someone to identify his career is that you have to list your strengths your skills and this we really find a suitable professions that will appreciate those skills are yeah, you the one that likes okay you like you have a computer skills you love working on programming and all that so where you have know your skills and what you are good at this will actually help you to know how to find your uh, career or how to tailor in order to meet up to your career expectation in life so and uh, the questions we have to ask ourselves in a postgraduate if i ask most people or most of us during the postgraduate study which is a question that we always try to avoid is that if anybody asks you what do you intend to do following the completion of your postgraduate studies maybe less than 80 percent to be able to give you concrete answers. in fact Many people always say that this is a wrong question to ask a postgraduate student, like asking any PhD student, when are you going to finish? When is your defense and things like that? This is a question that most people doesn't like to be asked during the postgraduate program, but it's a critical one that we have to always focus on. Because uh, uh, like if you think about, um, having a plan and when should i start having um or preparing for a postgraduate uh career uh there are so many reasons because the way we talk today i'm going to assume that we are talking to a midst of people that are still into phd that you are still in masters you are still going to pursue your phd at the end of your master's program so it might be the, probably focusing more on phd others than maybe master's degree but at least for the masters maybe people that just want to get their masters degree will still have one or two things to to uh take home from this uh, presentation so i don't want every one of us to any one of us to have like be a joker in this uh, dark night that says do i really look like a guy that I have a plan i think this is a response from uh most PhD. they will just tell you that oh i don't have any plan let me just finish on what uh, i'm uh, working on so which is not a good thing because when you are into a postgraduate program either masters or phd there are so many things that you have been denied of like for instance your career entry is uh, majorly being uh, delayed and uh, when you look at a critical case of a south korea whereby we don't have access to internship during the program it's a big challenge because you don't have uh, maybe industrial experience you don't have much most of us just like first degree you go into postgraduate program 
no internship you have to be in the lab almost maybe 10 to 14 hours in a day and uh, during the summer whatever you are still um in the lab so unlike in other countries like the western side let's say for instance in um, austria where i am most of the master's student and even the phd they are even in us also you have access to internship so these are the people that are going to be you know you are going to be having competition with during the recruitment process after the postgraduate so many of them will have like like in us many of them have access to like three times the internship in us but like in austria your program is always going to be internship throughout because they are given 30 hours to work per week so even your thesis everything is going to be with the indoors in the case of my school now i have at least we have two nigerians in my engineering electrical that they came in during uh, i think october the october last year when they resumed for the new section and by last month all of them now they've gotten places to do their internship um like having a work and study program which correlates with their uh degree program or what they are doing like one of them is even working with the best company in uh what was it called in austria in Finland, which is also in korea and they pay they are going to pay them like what they will pay a bachelor degree that's not like the way they pay like uh just like maybe for cheap laborers no they are going to pay them based on the degree they have because we have asset we have like uh, bodies that regulate all these salaries case most of the european countries have that so so the reason why people from south korea have to plan ahead is that we don't have all this program like internship just imagine somebody who has spent two years in the industry his thesis is also industrial based they can easily switch to either maybe after their phd or so they can easily switch to the industry because they have that two years even if it is just to help them in the laboratory work in the industry you know how it is and what they are doing so you can easily move to any other smaller companies even if they don't retain you in that big companies so these are the things that we have to think about in order to plan ahead and second thing is the relationships when you are in south korea or when you are abroad most of us we are out of our country maybe some of us have a, what was it called you have a fiance that you left behind during the program the you have a broken relationship uh some left the wife you have a delayed in childbearing where you're supposed to be having like three or four kids because of your postgraduate program you have to put it on hold until you finish your program and things like that so there's problem with relationship in that case and another reason why you have to plan ahead is the poor standard of living during the postgraduate program uh living on um maybe ten dollars that's uh, like one million one Per, or less than 1 million won per month that's in a per annum it's just between like 10k dollars to 24k so which is like a poor standard of living if they have to categorize it according to uh cost of living and minimum which it doesn't fit in at all so and also family hardship where during this process the our parents expecting things from us like and from as an african person you are unable to do all those things and just imagine you now finish your program and one is still not having a plan or where to put it it's a big challenge just to, and location issue in yeah in look in terms of location probably very far away from uh, the family or you don't even like the location where you are presently so you, maybe you have a places in your mind or you have a restricted places where you want to really settle down with your family so these are the reasons why one have to plan ahead and financial losses as well like most of us maybe you are in engineering like in engineering the popular said that money loss can never be recovered but in the case of uh, people in the profession like maybe uh, medical this thing years of uh, years they spend in the universities or in pursuing their degree program or any training they can easily recover them because they can easily take some uh part-time jobs in, apart from the one they have but if you are in engineering probably you only focus on a particular single job doing a side also may not be that easy so there are so many financial losses during the program it's difficult to to recover it then and we now look at uh production of phd orders degree over the decades three decades 
it's kind of alarming. So most times people think, oh, when you have PhD, it's easy access to get job. No, so it's not like that because if you look at the statistics of uh, US alone, we can see in 2022, they are already producing over 57,000. So we can see the increments over, over and over from there. So over like three decades, it's alarming the rate at which people are going used to maybe economy make than the rest. So PhD is not a uh, thing that maybe can really back on. So we need to have a strategies of approaching the job market. So, and um, the usual academic career opportunities for PhD does are no longer available or drying up gradually because of other politics. Most people even consider our Nigerian sectors, the Nigerian we have back home, they prefer to employ part-time lecturers than taking full-time due to, it's only maybe during accreditation, they just look around to, you know, meet up with the quota system of, uh, of the AUC. So most people, they just take, they go on relaxation mode when it is not an uh, accreditation period by using part-time and direct. So academics is not that available. So we have to plan ahead. But as um, as uh, we a PhD order, there are some things that uh, probably can uh, influence our career, which we have to always think about or what we have to uh, talk about. When you want to choose either a career or job, or what are the things that we want to do, we have to put in mind how much do we want to impact or how impactful we want to be, whether to quickly go for a job or what kind of career do we want to pick? Is it going to be in industrial or academics? So those are the questions that can ask, um, influence our career part. And also, we also need to think about what we are good at. We also have ourselves the kind of question, what you are good at and uh, how ambitious I am. I also have to ask each and every one of us has to ask this kind of question. And uh, we also need to think about how long for those that are in masters, how long is my schooling going to be? If I have to pull out from masters or I have to go for PhD, so how long is it going to take for me to achieve this career goal? and uh, what values of life do I think about? This also determines the kind of career we have to look at it. But having said all this, uh, the PhD order, as a PhD order, we already have uh, so many things to, uh, like a benefit or like a, like a merit over other maybe MS and BSc graduates, which has to do with uh, new work. And when we talk about the new work environment, you know, PhD will actually help you because of uh, the industry now. Everything has to do with maybe artificial intelligence, you know, big data and all the rest. So the industry now prefers to hire PhD others because of the new work environment, things that you have to do. They believe that by hiring a PhD others, you can easily fit in and settle down because of the level of skills that is kind of involved in today's uh, activities in the industry and also in the academy as well. Then we talk about the journey towards the PhD, which we believe that as a PhD order, it has, uh, we have the crucial, uh, crucial abilities in terms of uh, project management because at least one or two people might have participated in terms of maybe real companies project which you have to write report and things like that. Also, the research skills have been enhanced and time management, because if you don't know how to manage your time, definitely you can't finish with the PhD program. So during this time, you already have all these kind of skills that people like BSc and all that may not have. And uh, during the course of doctorate degree program, there are a lot of relationships that have been established, which I believe it's going to be a helpful way you can make contact in terms of searching for jobs. And also the develop instinct for staying up to date because of, yeah, as a PhD that we believe that at least you must be up to date in terms of your career feed. Yeah, what are the latest research trend and all those stuff. So this is why most, there's the advantages that we have over MSc and BSc does. And likewise, presentation and um, writing skills well improved. At the end, maybe most people after BSc or MSc, they still find it difficult to write even a conference paper and the rest. But at the end of PhD, I believe 
is a must. Like if you are in Korea to have uh, a paper, at least uh, in uh, SCI based paper. So which we believe this must have enhanced our writing and presentation skills. So if you look at the statistics of uh, US, how people are employed in terms of uh, engineering and uh, doctorate degree in scientists and engineer. We can say that at least nothing less than 76% in uh, the latest one they had in 2021 when I went to their website, we can see they are employed. So this gives you like, gives every one of us kind of hope. And uh, the uh, employed in part-time just 9% and we can see the unemployed is just 1.6. So which means there's still a large market for every PhD who does at least to find one or two things so those that are not a player or not seeking, you can see that just two percent. So at least there is still hope in when you have a PhD degree. So, um, but for the PhD, when we talk about PhD orders, there are a few things that people maybe find PhD degree may not be to for the career sake. Some may just be because of the to boost their ego, just to put PhD at the back of the name or to be called a doctor and the rest. But this should not be our own case as a, uh, in NSA, which is, I believe every one of us, we have it in the back of mind that PhD will serve as an umbrella for us when there is uh, on a rainy day. Maybe when there is a downward trend in the industry, you can easily move to uh, academia. And when there is, maybe you don't find happiness in academia, environment you can easily move back to industry so it's it's like uh, an umbrella on the rainy day so to say so what are now the standard career paths uh, for a phd degree or, that, or for that is applicable to many of us when we start from bachelor's degree those are the parts so at the end of the day we are going to see the options that we have to pathways that we can move towards. So if you go through the route of bachelor degree to work, and probably you find yourself doing the MSc degree, and from MSc degree, you might go back to work and probably proceed to pre PhD. Yeah, I think this is not common in um, uh, maybe South Korea. There is an option for pre PhD in um, Germany and Austria here. I think there was one of my friend that we did MSc together that I linked up with one the PhD program. You get paid uh, with your master's degree level. So it's like a full-time employment. So this is just to either test you on a project, you are, will be working on a project. They still also give access to teach or laboratory work. And um, yeah, you get well paid, at least the standard of payment that is uh, applicable to uh, MSc degree. Order. So it's very common and people in South Korea that are still in the MSc program can always look into, you see it being advertised everywhere, pre-PhD or pre-doctoral, this in Germany and Russia, you can easily access those things on internet and apply for them. You'll be called for interview and if you pass, definitely you get it. Yeah, so do you have a, uh, then proceed to doctoral studies fully, which takes about four to seven years. And uh, three to six years after the doctoral degree, so you have a way of, yeah, most times you move to academic postdoc, government postdoc or industrial postdoc, or probably you continue to other educations like maybe enhancing your vocational or some trainings and the rest. And uh, to not go into the career pathway proper or a real job, either a permanent job or tenure, as they call it in academia, then you can move to academies or governments and uh, industry or others. Like others fall under the categories of self employed, you establishing your own industry and the rest, or be a consultant and all those stuff. So we can see that. For us to be able to get to these stages, you can see the number of years at least, either moving straight from bachelor's to four to seven years, and this. So these are the pathways, and anyone that feels like, oh, this is too long, then you can easily move, navigate, or find a shortcut, and probably from here you can move back to PhD and still continue your job. Yeah. And, um, you know, this is just like a standard for um the way it is in um nigerian settings whereby you have to 
move. The educational settings in other countries are kind of different, whereby most people, they can easily develop their own career right from onset, like especially common to the European countries. They don't go to university degree in um, like uh, normal when you just move out of uh, secondary school and you just proceed into bachelor's degree program. No, they most most of the time they go to vocational studies and they call it um what is it called um yeah osbidon yeah they call it osbidon here in german way so osbidon is such a way that you go for it's just equivalent to vocational studies so if you want to go like electrical now we're going to take like two years program in these vocational centers and you'll be attached to industry you're going to get paid during this program and um and, and after that, they cannot proceed if they want to get a real bachelor's degree. They cannot go to the university and spend just maybe two years at most and get a bachelor's degree. So these are the kind of people we're going to compete with because most of them during their bachelor's degrees, they are companies that will sponsor and pay everything. So they have already developed their own career path. So, but unlike many people that like, just go through conventional way of doing bachelors and the rest, to develop our career path is kind of difficult because you just want to be good at almost everything and at the end of the day, uh, almost less than average in all those areas. So it's a difficult challenge which we have to address to focus more. So if you now look at the categories of uh, options that are available to move out. We have uh, academia and industry. There's uh, two ways to move out of uh, South Korea, if you want to move out. So you have now contemplating between that to choose between the industry or academia. Everyone is in this spot like this guy. Now you are trying to put one leg here and one leg here. So we are now going to look at the two options here. and. Um, it's what determines which one to go to depend on your goals and the rest and what you value most but anyone is still good so what how to now um make a choice between academia and industry is that we have to keep the following things in mind uh which are the uh we have to take account of our strength passions and uh, what motivates us and the values so what motivates us in terms of is it money the salary you get at the end of the month or what do you put values on is it work balance and the rest and uh, your strength skills and the rest so the two all these factors contribute to uh the choice which we have to make and uh we'll be looking at the personal goal you are your corporate goal do you uh the corporate goals uh, which one will affect your own personal goal because a corporate goal, you are in a team, you cannot make choice or you cannot choose which project or whatever research you want to work on. But if you have a personal goal which you want to do, like in terms of research and the rest, you may not fit in into industry. And what kind of field you are you in presently also determines that. And uh, basic and applied translational of your end work, maybe is it human impact, like you want to have a product and the rest. And then we talk about autonomy in terms of uh, maybe flexibility and the rest to just to choose, just like I explained the above uh, point. And then uh, when you look at the diverging of duties that are available, are you the people that cannot maybe uh, handle or multitask? So if you look at uh, academy now, you have to, you know, so you have an uh, independence research, but there are so other responsibilities that you have to work on, like grant applications, assistance, recruiting, resource requests, and the rest. So you have so many responsibilities to handle, but when it comes to industry, probably you just focus on a particular project, and even in the project, you are working in a team. So your own section will just be assigned to you, and you know what you are working on. Then in terms of hours of work, so uh, is it um, strictly office hour or you want to have your own time? So and uh, pay and job security. So the pay part and the security also determines that and the location you are tending to move to, which one are you looking at? Sometimes when you move to another country, it may not be suitable depending on the kind of career, your, your, in terms of your own um, 
your own career goal or what you have studied, the field which you have, which we're going to look at later on. So the main goal which uh, determines the path or locations, you can also ask which one gives you the path to your own career uh, goal or the location that allows for greater work and life balance. As we all know, you have to ask yourself questions. Which location give this work life balance? Like if you go to US, you go to Australia, Canada, Europe, at least everybody knows that when you talk of Europe, we talk about work life balance. By the time you come here, maybe probably with the spirit of South Korea, maybe I should tell you that you might probably become lazy. You know, when you see the way people work, you see that, oh, so life is as simple as this. You come to work and uh, no pressure. Uh, every top, everybody's talking about vacations when it's coming to, like, as we have now, summer is coming, people are talking about vacations and the rest, and you are mandated to even go, it's already on your system to even go already, it's already programmed. So it now depends on you when to take it or not. But you still be accumulating, whether you take it now or never, you still have to use it, even when you want to resign quit your job if you have accumulated of three months you have to use it they will just ask you not to come to work before maybe if you give them that notification so that work life balance something you have to consider but if you are considering of pay and the rest then you have to focus on some other things so we're going to take some case studies which uh we have here in terms of field of studies so this is the typical uh, breakdown that has uh, to do with uh, NSF in the um, US in terms for doctoral workforce. Where are the sectors that people are being uh, employed based on the discipline you have the breakdown. So you can see this is like a 50% average of it. And um, uh, the blue one indicates the people that are employed in the industry and those that are in academia and government. So when we talk of government, mostly we talk about the research research labs and uh, yeah, which we're still going to treat them, the three in details later on. So depending on the kind of uh, your program can influence your, your decision either to move to the industry, um, academia or government and uh, maybe the location. So you can see different um, disciplines. And uh, when you look at in terms of government, when you talk about the wildlife management, you can see they are more into going to be in people working with government uh, in terms of policy makers and the rest or some other things. So if you look at um, organic chemistry, so where you find them uh, mostly in the industry and you have lesser number of people a little uh, in academy. So when you look at astrophysics or uh, people like this, so you can find them mostly in academy. So when we look at uh, engineering, so in terms of this country of residence, which we say is a factor to be considered also. So apart from your program, country of residence is also a key factor. So if you look at engineering, these are the breakdowns of people that worked in terms of academy and uh, we have uh, pure mathematics. So know that knowing fully well that if you did uh, something like pure mathematics, your chances are kind of high when it comes to uh, academia and uh, industry kind of very low because pure, it's only people in applied mathematics that probably can easily move more into the industry or other sectors. And uh, we can see for the electrical and yeah, other courses. So you can use this to know, okay, what are the chances, at least a case study of US. Like for me now, during my own plan, my culture of residence, people that are close to me in South Korea, I think uh, uh, most times when we talk, maybe when we are moving around, they always ask me, oh, why not try Australia? I used to tell them I can never try Australia. It's just like me putting myself, narrowing myself into like a 10% chance of being unemployed. Yeah, because when I look at Australia, looking at a case study of um, LinkedIn, if I put my own area of uh, research into LinkedIn, probably, and I sought it for a week, mostly I just get advert of maybe 10 advert in uh, Australia and um, out of 10 you find out that maybe seven of them are already requesting that you must be an Australian citizens 
So now if you are like somebody who is working in a food, maybe you study something like food science or food engineering, that place might be good for you. Chemistry, probably good for you. Software, if you are into maybe software, but if you are into more of hardware, most of their technologies or in terms of hardware are being managed more from UK. Because when I apply to some companies in the UK, you see that they will probably tell you that maybe you work also with the uh, some companies in Australia, they will put it in those job adverts in uk com companies so when it depends on the kind of uh, your course or your career area or your discipline also can influence your country so, so as i talk of uh, that of australia now that may be probably 10 if i put it in us i'm going to get over advert that are just being advertised positions that have been advertised just within one week at least nothing less than 800 i did it for someone that was like maybe i'd don't want to go to Australia when I was in Korea and I showed him that was when he realized what I was saying that oh I can never trust so even if I move with postdoc to Australia and I headed up there probably if there is a issue between me and my maybe postdoc supervisor then I might be end of it will be end of life to get another opportunities but when you come to the US in my own area if I put the advert and I sort it out LinkedIn one week I will see like over 800 in germany no sorry in us i'll see over 1000 but in germany i'll see around 800 so all these kind of things have to govern us which area should i move to am i going to move to a place whereby maybe just everybody is moving or maybe because they say they get web page and all that may not be your own area so but there are some countries that have focus on maybe medical area or environmental all those kind of stuff agriculture so it depends on which uh, country, what does their focus, and which area do their government pump money to for research and things like that or development? So you have to also consider this in terms of a country to think of when you want to make a choice of either industry or uh, academia as well or uh, the country to live on, yeah, country of residence. So another thing which can also be um, factors to consider is uh, industry, is uh, wages, which has to do with, oh, I have to speed up a little bit. Yeah, so we have um, Asia, we can see their pay, and you see the Europe in terms of academia, industry, and uh, in UK, it's almost equal, but United States kind of different. So which I think I've mentioned all these kind of points. So maybe you can have a look of the chart. So in terms of Europe, so uh, when I look at these statistics based on my own experience during the interview and negotiation, I saw that at least most of these graphs are equal. So you can easily see where to think of when you want to move. So when you talk about UK, there is no much difference in that industry or academy, academia. So you may just put yourself into a motion. So when you talk about the career pathways in terms of academia, so you ended up to either being a professor, or when you talk about the industry or uh, labs, you talk about engineers, research management, and government lab, you talk of research scientists and the rest. So um, we have the career good, which is a academia uh, part, career pathways. So this is a typical one for uh, Europe in terms of UK. So if you start from student level, these are the things you can benefit from as a PhD, studentship, conference, and the rest, and research fellow. So which means after your PhD program, the entry point could be research fellow, and maybe we talk of postdoc and the rest. These are the uh, Marie Curie. We are going to talk about some other, all these, we are going to talk about them. The fellowship you can apply from so let me just rush it as senior research as a senior researcher which is equivalent to assistant professor in the us so these are the things that you have to work on in terms of uh, funding and the rest and you have associate professors level so and uh, when we talk of academia as well we talk about adjunct professors while you are still working you can still be adjunct either when you are employed and all those stuff so this can also help you by the time you start as an adjunct professor if you are lucky i apply to some of them yeah if you are lucky through that you can still count as an experience for you to move ahead so but you can see the points under adult professors that you, it's just like a part-time work. You don't have a benefit and you can also work 
uh, elsewhere. So there are some calls that they advertise for adjunct professor remotely, which you can also explore online. Like uh, some uh, UK schools that are in um, China and the rest that they have similar names. So they always call for that on LinkedIn. You can easily see them to apply for. So how do you apply and steps that are involved in academia? Always prepare ahead. That's just first thing. You, because there are a lot of paperwork that you have to do. So you have to at least have a template, even if you are going to modify them. For instance, um, in universities, most of them do have you to write statement of uh, diversity, equality. You have to write those things. So you need to have a template because you have to show them to them that you have knowledge about equality, what it comes to equality, and you have to demonstrate areas where you have demonstrated that before. Like most things that I usually put, because when I was in Kwasu, at least I acted as an HOD for more than one year before I left. So at least I talked about areas that, okay, I do assign some duties to uh, female lecturers in the department, which has never happened before because they were not managing any portfolio. So those are the things you can easily put when it comes to equity. So you have to prepare most of these paperwork ahead because when it comes, you have limited time. You have to update your CVs, and um, you know it depends on whatever your expectation according to the advertisement. You have to always do that, and uh, you move to application submission, and um, which you have to avoid grammatical and typographical errors. And also, when you apply after your application, you have to follow up requests from your referee and transcript. Some of them ask for transcript, and your referees is key. Some of them they will ask for your current supervisor, especially after the PhD, your supervisor must be able to write your referee report for you on your behalf, because most of them, especially in the UK, they will ask for it from your PhD supervisor. So please, this is very important. So you, there must be a way to bridge that gap if you don't have good relationship with your supervisors. Then you need to prepare slides. Under the slides, that is where you can express yourself you have to put on things you have done the especially you have to um tailor your slides towards your own strength very well especially the industrial project if you are lucky to participate in any one during the course of your program and um another thing you have to talk about are your um you have to categorize those phd in form of your experience otherwise it's like you uh shooting yourself uh, down so please you must prepare your CV such a way that at least you put all those uh, research work that you did in form of industrial in a way to be uh, like that will count as your own experience. Otherwise, they won't take count it as you and it will affect your offer and your salary and the rest in terms of negotiation. But I will advise you not to be too desperate. This is from my own experience. When I was sending mails, especially academia, is about selfish interest. When I was sending my CVs out for post uh, postdoc in some professors in US or Canada, many of them, even those that are Africa background, they will say, oh, they don't have money to pay for PhD, but if I don't mind, we do another PhD. So I got like three responses from like this from like more than three professors in when I was looking for those postdoc and by sending mails to them. So they asked for PhD. So if you are too desperate, you might just put yourself into something that probably you may not maybe feel like. Do I met a guy when I went to US in conference last day because they believe that where you are coming from Asia, you are kind of desperate of moving down to the western side. I met a guy who in the conference he did his PhD in China and uh, he was doing another phd in canada so in fact it was under the same professor that i contacted that gave me that same offer so when they see you that you are coming from asia they will just like oh they will throw this kind of offer to you like come for another phd they don't have money it is not going to be like that you are still going to subject yourself to qualifying exam and all those series of things that you must do in phd which may affect your long time goal and yeah so we i will don't be too desperate when it comes to academia and what i mean by academia is being about selfish uh interest is just like we have some discussion with some professors when we met at a workshop and they were happy so excited that economy is coming down 
and they say, oh, there'll be more money in the universities because many people will lose their job in the industry and probably people that have masters will still have to come back to academy to register for another masters. We have people like that, that whenever they lose their job, just to retain their uh, stays in the country, they probably going to another postgraduate program, whether they have masters before they will still quickly register because take, uh, for instance, in the case of US, if you lose your job, you have to exit under three months if you're unable to find another employer to sponsor your this thing. So these are the kind of things you have to be well informed. You need to know the country's policy and what kind of things can happen, which one is more secure for you to go into. So, so these are the few selected grants that we have or fellowship that can help you to move out. These I listed those ones that are cut across all the disciplines. So I they mentioned those ones that are strictly maybe for kind of one discipline or the rest. So you have a popular one, Banting Postdoctoral Fellowship in Canada, and it's usually April to September. Have it in the back of your mind that you need to get a host uh, supervisor that is going to write about two or three pages as a requirement. It's required for you to, for him to be able to write at least up to, I think minimum of two pages. I got somebody in Canada then, but, I haven't finished. So you have to prepare ahead to look out for the target. It's every year between April and September. So most schools have their own closing time before this general deadline because they want to do internal selection because each school must nominate just a single person. So you have to contact somebody that is going to be like your old supervisor who is going to write a supporting document for you. And um, then it will nominate you for the university. Then you go through the university process, and that university will now nominate you to the central one, which is deadline for September. So you have to prepare ahead because of so many things that you like your document that you have to prepare for this banting one. In fact, it can take you up more than two months if you had to prepare. I did that, but then I haven't finished my PhD, and they also asked me to get some document from uh, KU, and you know. Uh, if you haven't finished your PhD, uh, your spouse may not be ready to write anything for you. So that was why I stopped that. And yeah, so but yeah, those, you just have to establish if you are targeting this, you have to establish a relationship with a Canadian professor that is going to write this for you. It's not an easy thing. When he wrote about, in fact, more than two pages, because they stated the minimum pages he must write. And yeah, it's a real work. There you have this uh, Marie Curie postdoctoral fellowship, which is uh, Europe. So the deadline is coming in September. The same thing, you have to find a host university and a professor to get document from them. So if you are working towards going to graduate by December, you still allow you because this program will start, for instance, they will start by 2025, I think in February. Then you can still defer until you, your resumption for almost one year. So you can start ahead in this case. If your supervisor can write it, even if you are going to graduate by December of which convocation by February, you can still ask your supervisor to assist you that you're going to write a document stating that you will finish before the program. Then for this Marie Curie as well, is a standard one. You get well paid and you'll be served, uh, what was it called? You can uh, start your own um, research uh, group with this kind of because it is well paid yeah for this Marie Curie and you have also European Research Council starting grant for researchers so this one you must have two to seven years post grad post PhD experience before you can apply for a starting uh, grant and uh, this for Germany which is uh, like three batches in a year so you have March July and November so March have passed you can still work with July and uh, November. So these are the links which you can go through. If you have questions, at least especially for this banting one, I can at least guide you through. And for this Marie Curie, at least I can still um, guide uh, up. And uh, also for the Fulbright postdoctoral, which has to do with US, you can read more about it. Yeah, I met with a guy during in US who that got this from uh, Tanzania. I also finished from South Korea and is with a Nigerian professor in US. Yeah, we're in the same field, so we met at a conference. So it's like kind of straightforward. Once you have a host, just, just almost all of them requires a host university or a host uh, supervisor. 
So you must contact the professor in those countries, most of them. Even this Royal Newton uh, Society International Fellowship, yeah. Uh, it, this one also I applied, at least I can help, but I didn't submit this application before I got my offer in Austria. So this one, I was linked by my ex-student in my lab in South Korea, a Pakistan guy. He was working with a professor then, but if you are in UK, I think you cannot apply for this. If you have entered through a postdoc to UK, you may not be able to apply for this particular one. So this one also, you need a uh, supervisor. In fact, we have worked and all that to adjust the proposal and the rest. So before I told him that I got another offer that I have to stop. So uh, you have this woman frontier and the rest. So for other postdoctoral researchers, for any, so the, all these ones are for postdoctoral researchers for all nationality. These ones are list. So you can apply and it's for any food. And uh, for you, you can also search for university sponsor postdoctoral and the privilege fellowship. So these are mostly for the career tracks. There's a uh, tenor track for the bridge program. Most of the postdoctoral that have been uh, announced by the universities, if you see this bridge program, which means after your postdoctoral program, maybe two years, or even if you perform very well in that two years, you can get a tenor position. So you can easily put that or set uh, this thing on uh, LinkedIn for those. So for industry, sorry, I have to rush this industry. We talked about industry, which has to do with establishing your own company, into things like the compasses, and uh, work for a firm. You can work for a firm, or you can work as a research laboratory, like a national research laboratory in other countries. So what are the valuable strategies that uh, you can help you to get into in, or where you, how you can get into land and industry job is by connecting with individuals in your desired feed on LinkedIn. This worked a lot. And uh, please, if you are thinking about industry job, let me just say this before this thing. Please, if you are doing a postdoc or whatever, or you are still in academic environment, avoid using, um, organizing your name with titles that are academic related. Yeah, because you may not get, um, what was it called, offer of um, being contacted by recruiters. As I am to down, I still get some recruiters that still inbox me. Am I interested? Although I haven't updated my LinkedIn, that I'm in Austria, many of them do want to move to Europe, they still contact at least one or two in every week. So if you put too much of this thing, they might not want to consider you in this kind of case because they'll think, oh, you have found um, a career path in academia, so you have to avoid this. If you are still thinking which one to go for, so avoid titles that might probably not suitable for industry on LinkedIn. Then you have to establish connection during your graduate years. We have talked about that. Yeah, you have to volunteer at conferences. This helps a lot. Um, during conferences, you work and there are some positions that some professors, they can just uh, nominate you directly. They have a way of relating with some industries. Then reach out to both recruiters and employers. You can send your CV. There are some of them that they have, um, what was it called? Um, these um, unsolicited applications and it's really helpful. I've done that, that I got invited for some interviews during my own time. So you can still go through their website and apply for through this unsolicited uh, approach. Then you have to publicize your employment search. If you are in desperate in need of one, yeah, you have to be active and let people know that you are looking for jobs. So what are the career growth part in the industry? We have it here for a fresh uh, BNG, MSc, PhD, sorry, because it is in engineering field. So as a fresh PhD, you start with a senior engineer or you must have five years experience. So, but you, when you are fresh PhD, you can be taken as well in this. So, and um, in most countries that are well regulated, where, um, what was it called? Their labor is well regulated. They will never cheat you, especially when you come to Europe because you have bodies that supervise whatever the industry wants to take you. So whatever degree you presented, they have, they are, even they are regulating the industries in Austria and Germany. So if you have PhD that are going to industry, they are going to hire you for this level and you get paid. And even in Belgium, yeah. So I can talk about Belgium as well, because at least I was um, 
into a recruitment in industry there so at least which i know at least the procedures as well so you have a principal engineers and up to this level and when we talk about some other like um a research lab so you can talk about researchers senior researchers so you can see the years it uh, yeah, this is equivalent of it when it comes to fresh PhD and the rest. So it depends on the organization. So the rules might be kind of different. You have to have that at the back of your mind that the rules might kind of depend on the way they use the title. But this is just like more of like generalized one. So we have the government research labs, which I think is the what well, I can say that well paid job based on my experience. If somebody is going to ask me, why will I move to US? I can only move to US with government research labs. At least if you are working as a senior scientist in US, your paid is going to be around 180 to over $200,000. So these are the areas you can focus on. And if you, you can go in through your postdoc, and um, what are the things that we're going to do here is that if you are going to government research labs, you have opportunity to address national and global issues because you have uh, they are working on government or what's their national problem. So these are the things that you work on when it comes to government research labs and impact opportunities because you are going to be bridging gap between academia and industry. So you're, you are both uh, working with the academia and industry sectors and also you uh, can also do a part-time teaching because most in my universities we use more people that are working in research labs as well to lecture because you must you have phd degree holders a lot of them you must be phd holders you have to work in most of those cases and it's not like uh, research labs that we have in nigeria when it comes to abroad we they would work more of a project in fact the government in austria how focus more on their national research labs than the universities not like uh, the way it works in south korea that they have grants the in the national research labs they get more of these uh funds and uh, uh during the my visit when uh one of the nigerian professors where we have little gathering so the professors called one professor called one guy that moved from university back to national research lab in us and they asked him to educate us more about benefit of moving to national research lab and why he chose to why he left the u.s academic environment so the guy made us to know that you have less pressure when it comes to writing grants because there are channels where you get the grant directly from the government so you don't need to focus more on the writing different proposal and the rest and they have a way of getting the grant which is always sure for them and they utilize it so you can see the track for it in a way like in a progressive way downward like this then you have a senior scientist and the rest so i've said this more. Yeah, so, mm -hmm. so i have said this so you have uh talk about the pros and cons of industry so you can when you talk about industry you have good teamwork and uh you know in the industry you have little you are just restricted to little work to do so you have good salary and uh, you have access to real work and the only problem is that you are constrained on the areas of personal research you may not be able to do your personal research but for the academia you have fund management you, uh, issue thinking of how to get grants and how to get it renewed and you have a pressure to publish or perish on the uh, academia environment then so these are the ways for you to get uh through a graduate job search so which you can follow the trend i think we almost cover most of those things like same with academia environment so you can go through them and the rest if you have questions then when you are navigating through a uh, job search which you can always use in linkedin i which always help to submit more application is that you can easily sort the job with the title maybe the stage for instance like this then maybe for the past week especially i use this often when you are targeting industry job because most of them use a recruiter so with this easy apply once you have your cv there you can apply to hundreds of job why it's just on your bed because your cv is already on linkedin and they will reach out to you so you just all submit and the rest
So this is a very easy way. Then maybe you can just focus a little more on those that you have to sign up, fill those forms and all those rest. So there are some uh, com countries that have work permits, which are will, for job seeking visas, so which is uh, like United States, you have EB2 and uh, NIW, and which is a visa for individual with highest degree. And then um, in this case, yeah, you don't need a company to sponsor that. You can self-petition yourself, but I recommend you to consult an immigration lawyer in this case for this EB visa, because you know the problem of US is that once you don't have a work permit, they might not want to give, they will tell you not to even apply because they are not ready to sponsor. So once you get this, at least you have been able to uh, move over that, at least you don't have a problem with work permit once you're able to get this. And this is uh, more popular once you have about maybe PhD and maybe two conference papers or this thing, you are qualified to get all this. Then you can explore permanent resident in case of Canada and Australia, which I think probably another person might handle that. I don't know in terms of your plan in um, NSA, but for Austria, we have high qualified workers that you must get 70 points for job seeking visa and it's up to six months. And we have um, this thing, uh, AMS, body that support people, a lot of people from uh, India and all those people, you used to come through here, through this route to get a job. So you need to focus on maybe your strength, look for if your job is well on a shortage list in this, and they're gonna support you when you come in terms of language, free and have the rest. And if you need to go for vocational study to enhance your skills, they can easily give you. So you can visit this link for you to see more about that. So which is uh, insurance, about the insurance of it. If you have questions, you can ask me. And Germany also have similar program and you talk about block account. So in summary, you consider this as work environment for you to make a choice, career advancement opportunities, which one is pays better, compensation level, consider your priorities, identify your strengths, require, uh, inquire about your career trajectories of scientists, and you inquire from there about their own trajectories as uh, scientists, any scientists you encounter, and be open to alternatives, whether industry or this, you are, must be open to alternatives. Don't just be rigid. And um, whatever decision you make, just know that decision is yours and only you know what is best for you. So thank you. And uh, yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Shogo. You have really done justice for the uh, topic. Uh, it's just as if we didn't want you to like stop talking. I'm so sorry, our time is far spent and we want to yeah. appreciate Dr. Shogo for a very interesting uh, topic. Uh, I listened right from the beginning to the end. I have learned so many things. And I'm, I'm very sure that a lot of attendees are really eager to ask their questions. So we, we have other some questions because we don't have so much time. Uh, okay. I will acknowledge um Ola, what is this? Ola, okay, Ola, Ola, what is this? Okay, please, it's hard to read. Please go ahead. Ola Rewaji. <laughs> ah, Ola Rewaji. Ah, it's the president. Ola, uh, good evening. Yes, uh, please. Good, uh, good evening. Thanks, Dr. Shugo. I really enjoyed Please, you have uh, this seconds, uh, yeah, my work. question is this i if you are planning on moving to the uk like in the yep. field of uh, drug research drug discovery and what you have here probably is not really aligning and you is it possible if you switch from chemical engineering to the industry or perhaps even if you do not complete your PhD, is it very possible for you to move to the UK and enter the industry or you have to start another PhD? Or I don't really know. That's a question. Thank you. Okay. So should we take the all the yes, questions? Yes. Yeah, please or as, it, as it comes because of the time. And please okay. be brief with it, sir. Yeah. Um, in terms of um, maybe UK switching, uh career from uh, i think you said you did chemistry or chemical engineering also to food or maybe drug related yeah is uh 
possible if you if what they do in labs um in the industry whatever they are doing if they find you worthy of maybe integrating to their own um kind of work that they do in their own labs yeah they will definitely hire you based on that it's not really they are not that rigid but the only thing is that at least they must see and uh, what you are going to bring uh to them like what are the things that you yourself is going to contribute to them what they can benefit from you because it's just about give and take so if you are coming in and they say that oh because of your maybe research exposure and skills or maybe it can even be because of some equipment during the interview that you have operated on or you have worked on in um, korea if it is just same thing that you're going to be working on just say for instance maybe you are working on uh, some scanning machine or whatever definitely they will going to hire you. you don't need to go for another phd or maybe your design they might probably have some in-house training for you so they always have those kind of things and you can easily go for training based on uh, uk also works with like european standard a little bit you are qualified to take a break to go and do some other qualifications which they must still continue paying your salary. Like for instance, if I want to change, acquire some other skills now, maybe in um, IT or some whatever thing, if I'm going there now, they must still continue paying my salary when I take that those programs. So I think it's not a problem. Yes, thank you so much. There's a question that just came in uh, from Mr. Pongo Joseph. Is it possible to get a job after MSc degree in Europe or US? Briefly, sir. Yeah, it's now, possible. So yeah, it's possible. For instance, I have a Sudanese guy that did his master's from um, Saudi and is being hired even in my school as a junior researcher. And why they still sponsored his uh, PhD and he's been paid good salary as a, what's it called, as an MSc degree holder. So you can get job easily with MSc, but US, in terms of US, is just visa sponsorship problem. Yeah that problem is always there you when you go on linkedin and you see the hard drive they'll ask you they don't sponsor uh what is it called visa whatever work permit you must get it yourself but you can still try and apply to this eb stuff if you want to do that it's not necessary that you must have phd with msc a lot of nigerians also got it but for europe yeah you are good to go with your msc yeah thank you that so is no problem much. Yeah, there's a question here. How can I easily identify opportunities available within my career pathway? The person is a social, uh, is a graduate of soil and water engineering. I think you mentioned it uh, during the lecture about the LinkedIn uh, job search. I don't know if yeah. we can we'll talk more about it briefly. Like yeah. Yeah, in the, um, terms of LinkedIn, so if you search for the jobs in your area, like area of um, discipline so you can put it as a keyword set a lot i always get a lot maybe every day you can put it in form of let me just show this slide so you can easily yeah put it in form of words maybe or you can put it as europe in terms of this location so if you see a lot of you can see those that are um, peculiar to your own area of study and uh, you can look at the requirements so you can see the skills that you have and how was the career progress some of them if you apply to a senior one never never uh be shy to apply for a position that's either lesser to you or higher than you like one high where i am now they advertise for junior researcher which is equivalent to msc and i apply and during the interview then i was taking and they still counted my years of nigerian teaching experience that was why they were able to give me that level so never feel shy to apply for something that is below even if it's just engineer once you just apply for it with your msc during the application interview process you negotiate they know your qualification for them to call, call you for interview so just use this box to sort it out and see different jobs and know what is the requirement skills that you must have before you finish your program I think that's that will really help. So I don't know if I answered yeah, that. I think question. you did justice to it, uh, Doc. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for that. There's another question here. It says uh, it's from I think it's from YouTube, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, based okay. on your experience, 
what specific skills do you consider highly valued by employers? Please, in just 30 seconds, sir. Yeah. Like the, minutes. Yeah, the one that is highly valued in terms of, uh, in my own from uh, European this thing is just like your own personal and uh, you must be well committed in whatever you are doing. That's the, they, they value that much, like more attention into whatever you want to do for them. And uh, it now depends on, in terms of technical skills, because we can categorize skills into different areas, depending on personal computing skills and all that, and technical skills, hardware skills and the rest. So in terms of um, skills, it now depends on your own areas of uh, maybe this kind of job you are looking for. But I would advise you for job security, whatever you are doing, make sure you have a laboratory or address keys for those. Don't rely on software skills because you will have faced more challenges in terms of competition. But when you have either laboratory experimental skills or address keys when it comes to like all these electrical and whatever, then your job is easily secured because most people are running away from experimental work. So you can easily land yourself a job when you have those two skills. Hardware, if it is um, uh, laboratory skills, have the two, experimental. If you limit yourself to data analysis, then there are a lot of people that can do it better than you. I'm telling you, there will be competition in terms of that area. So that is, I think, what I can say about that. But your I job is secure so. when you have that hardware skills and laboratory skills. Uh, thank you so much, Doctor. We have quite yeah. a, a number of questions there. Uh, maybe yeah. after the session, I see one that has to talk about family relocation, flight, accommodation, oh, yeah. and visa. Yeah, I, I'm so sorry. <laughs> it will be so hard to take the, uh, <laughs> yeah. the questions. Maybe we we'll forward the questions to you, and then we we'll put it on our platforms. Please, attendees, okay. do not forget that you can follow us on our, our Facebook handle. Uh, you can follow us also on Instagram, and also you can follow us on uh, YouTube at NSAKNU. Uh, our website is www.nsaknu.com. Also, you can also follow us for updates about NSA activities on Twitter as well, NSAKNU. We have a lot of questions here. However, we're going to send the questions over to you, Doctor. Please, uh, mm -hmm. your free time, please uh, try to answer, and then we'll put it up. Uh, also, you can find a copy of uh, Doctor's uh, PPT on our, our website. And we are currently uh, hosting this uh, the video session uh, on our YouTube channel. You can still have a look at the recording later. In the light of that, uh, I would like to call on the president, the current president of uh, NSA KNU, to give the vote of thanks. President, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much um, for the opportunity. Uh, um, first of all, I would like to thank um, the uh, Knowledge Sharing Committee for um, hosting this kind of informative session for, for us. And definitely the, the impact from the last one that we had, which had to do with the one job, job career search in, in Korea. So this one, I believe that people would have learned a lot. And I, from the questions we have seen that have coming in uh, definitely is talking about the impact already so without further ado i would like to thank our doctor doctor Shugo, for hearing our call he is one of us he's one of the product of the association and we are so grateful that we uh, he's somewhere better and he's climbing the ladder and by by thought he's able to pass down the experience to us we really appreciate his um knowledge and wisdom so far and most especially how he was able to do justice to the given topic and as all of us will have known by now especially those of us that are still doing, uh, having our program on our phd program we can see that we have a lot to prepare for so we have a lot to prepare for we can't just say ah okay when i'm done with my phd then i will look for when i'm done with this we have to start preparing from now on and uh, from the useful information. In fact, what, one of the things I enjoyed about this session is are the statistics. Uh, statistics don't lie. We can see what we have, what we are up to, what we are up against. So I want to thank uh, Dr. Shugo for 
um, taking out of his busy schedule to cook up this very informative and detailed uh, presentation. We really appreciate you. And also, we appreciate everyone that are able to join today for the session. It has been really powerful. Personally, I I have gained a lot, so and I'm very sure that every other person that joined this session has also done that. So we appreciate everyone, and thank you once again, Doctor. We we hope that when we call again and regarding the questions that we have, you'll be able to answer to our call. So thank you very much, everyone, and that will be my vote of thanks, the Chairman. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. President. Thank you so much, our honorable speaker for the day. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, everyone. We acknowledge the presence of Dr. Bashir and several other, uh, we acknowledge the presence of uh, Dr. Taufik for all the way from Nigeria. We acknowledge the presence of Dr. Howell and several other distinguished members of the NSA KNU. We appreciate everyone for making it a point of duty to be here. Please be informed that we'll be having another session in May. Yeah. On May 12th, we'll be having freelancing tips, unlocking extra income opportunities in Korea. And also, if you are not in Korea, you, have, you can still consider the possibility of joining us uh, as, it, as this has to do with money. So uh, I would like to draw the curtain uh, to this special occasion. I'll see you on May 12th. Have a wonderful day. Have a wonderful afternoon, evening, or whatever it is, where you, wherever you are. See you.